I'm getting all hung up this morning. <laughs> Good morning. And a very warm welcome to you all to our worship here at Castle Methodist Church this morning. We welcome those who will be following us online and also to those who will be listening to the recording of this service during the week ahead. And we ask that God will bless us all as we are united in fellowship with each other. I Just before we came in, I was given one piece of sad news. I've just heard that during this last week, our dear friend Les Charlton passed away. I don't have any further details. It was actually assumed that I would know this information and I, I didn't. So we remember Les's family, Julie and the boys, in our prayers. This morning our worship is being led by our group of worship leaders and friends. So let us prepare ourselves with a moment of quiet, remembering we are here in the presence of our Lord. Let us join together to worship God, the source of all love, compassion and justice, as we seek to become fit to do God's will in the world. Let us pray. Lord, awaken us this morning to the needs of your world, the pains and tensions in our communities, the dangers and hardships in the most vulnerable areas of this warming planet. Show us the importance of love in all the difficult choices and decisions we are called upon to make, big or small. Amen. We say together, Psalm 25. I'll read the words in the black type and you read the words in whatever, oh, in the red type, please, thank you. <laughs> to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Don't disappoint any of your worshippers, but disappoint all deceitful liars. Show me your paths and teach me to follow. Guide me by your truth and instruct me. You keep me safe and I always trust you. Please, Lord, remember you have always been patient and kind. Forget each wrong I did when I was young. Show how truly kind you are and remember me. You are honest and merciful, and you teach sinners how to follow your path. You lead humble people to do what is right and to stay on your path. In everything you do, you are kind and faithful to everyone who keeps our agreement with you. Our first hymn this morning is singing the faith number 164 your words to me are life and health
Let us pray. A prayer of adoration. O Lord, you are our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Joseph, the God of Moses, the prophets and psalmists, the God of priests, Levites and Samaritans, the God of disciples and apostles, the God of Jews and Gentiles, the God of the good, the bad and the ugly. O Lord, you are our God, you are my God, and your promises to us are immense, beyond our imagining, beyond what we deserve. You are our God and we adore you for all you are and for all your ways and all your love this and every day. Amen. And a prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, in a world of so many choices, with so many options, so many routes to take and roads to follow, we give you thanks that in the, all the mix of life, you are there. You are here with us and always will be. We give you thanks that you have inspired so many people to live their lives with love and support and generosity. We give you thanks that you have set hearts on fire with passion and commitment to serve you and our neighbours in the way you would have us do. We give thanks that we can read and share your word, know your truth, feel your peace, and have the freedom to choose right from wrong. For all this and so much more, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. And we join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. When you come up and join me up the front, will you? There's plenty of chairs, there's even one for me this morning. Any more? Any more? Any more? Anyone? Come in. Good. Hey, I like the hat. Actually, you'd be all right behind there. Now, do you remember what Ashley read about last week? No? None of you? Ashley, what did you read about last week? Yes, the, yeah, the Elisha and the healing of the leper, the man with leprosy. The story this week is a similar time in the Old Testament, but it's with the prophet Elijah. And I've actually written it down here because it sounds so much like Elisha that I might make a mistake while I'm just talking. But the, this is the story of a about the prophet Elijah. Elijah was the prophet of God and he had problems with the queen of the country um, where they lived who wanted and worshipped a different god called Baal. Baal wasn't a particularly nice god and the queen was not a particularly nice queen. Uh, and Elijah was always having arguments with her and after one particular nasty argument, Elijah thought, well, perhaps I'll make myself scarce for a while and keep out of trouble. And he went off and he hid in a valley in the hills between the two countries. And he was okay there for a while. There was plenty of water. And as the story goes, the birds came and fed him and he, he hid very comfortably. And he, he was all right until the water ran out. The stream dried up and the birds didn't bring him any food anymore. And he thought, no, I've got to get out, I've got to get out. So he, he walked out from the other side of the valley 
and went towards the nearest village, uh, which was in the country that the Queen ruled. And he thought, oh, what's going to happen? I wonder who's going to like me. This is not my country. I'm going to be a refugee, but I am hungry. What can I expect to happen? And he found a widow lady with her son who was gathering sticks. Um, for, and uh, he went up to her and said, excuse me, ma'am, he said, um, do, do you think you could let me have a glass of water? Uh, he said, yeah, okay, she gave him a glass of water. And then he said, well, he said, Did you, do you think you could possibly take me to your home uh, and, and make me some bread with your flour and some olive oil? Oh, well, she wasn't quite so sure about that because this man looked dishevelled, emaciated, he was hungry, and he wasn't one of them. And so she thought, well, what should I do? He, he's certainly in need of my food and water, but on the other hand, I might get into trouble if I do, don't do what the rules say and uh, tell the Queen where he is. What do you think she did? Do you think she sent him packing? No, no, you're right. No, she didn't. She said, no, okay, okay, I'll do the right thing. You come to my house and uh, we'll make some bread and we'll feed you. It might be the last loaves that I'm able to make because my uh, flour jar is virtually empty. But Elijah was very pleased, you can imagine that, so he went back and she made us some bread with the flour and the olive oil and baked it and she and her son shared what seemed to be the last meal. Well, Elijah stayed there for a little while, and the next morning, to the widow's surprise, when she got up and looked in her flower jar, there was still flour in it. Oh, she said, that's funny, I thought we used it up last night. But there it was, so she used it and she made some more. And the next day, the same thing happened. And it went on and on. And she had a flower jar which never got empty of flour. I think Elijah had something to do with that, don't you? But the important thing is that she did what was the right thing, even though it wasn't quite what the Queen wanted them to do. You're going to hear some more, another story about that later on. But for, the, for the next him, we're going to sing something which I think, had Elijah known it, it would have been his song. Um, and I suspect you know it as well. But will you stay there and sing it with us before you go? When I needed a neighbour, were you there?
Now we'll say a prayer for you just as you go. We ask you, Lord, to go with our young people as they go into their own room. We ask that as they look at the stories and do the pictures and the puzzles, they may learn something about doing the right thing, even in difficult circumstances. Amen. first reading this morning comes from Colossians chapter 1, reading the first 14 verses. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Ephraim, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and whom also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and praise him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Thanks be to God. Some thoughts on that reading from Colossians from Roots. Paul's desire throughout this letter is for faithful Christian living by those who are challenged by the complex multicultural world in which they find themselves. While there is much to celebrate in the church's faith, hope and love, there is no room for complacency. Paul and Timothy have been constantly praying that God will give the Christians of Colossus the spiritual wisdom and understanding that will enable them to discern his will for them. Paul says that they must aim high and not underestimate the moral and spiritual strength that will be required if they are to live lives worthy of the Lord. Where does this come from? 
The heady liberation experienced by the Colossian believers is being fashioned by Jesus because they have now come under his authority. But the letter contains no quotations from Jesus' teaching, no parables to provoke and inspire its readers. For Paul, doing the right thing is not a matter of following rules or principles, but living out the faith of their baptism in a community of disciples as the character of Christ is formed in them. And now we sing again from Singing the Faith, number 161. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. Our Gospel reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 10, beginning to read at verse 25, the familiar story, the parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life. What is written in the law? He replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. 
Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But the Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go, do likewise. Thanks be to God. Amen. That's going to be me. Ah, do take a seat, Mr. Uh, Mr. Good. Do um, sit down. Um, it's Sam, please. No one calls him Mr. Good. Very well, Mr. Good. Uh, Sam, Miss. Yes. So I've been speaking with that new rabbi outside. He's quite interested in your case, actually. He says I ought to look into it properly because then I'll understand what God's way is really about. Hmm. I find it hard to believe. It's, uh, it seems quite clear to me that you were very irresponsible. And if I'm to take on your case, I need to clarify the situation. So, your employers say you messed about at an inn outside Jericho, thereby wrecking an important deal at a very delicate point, that you came back without valuable samples of oil and wine, which you'd been provided with, that you claimed you had used the samples to save a man's life. But you can't produce a man. Furthermore, the donkey assigned to you has been misappropriated by you. It was returned eventually, exhausted, and the, um, the saddle cloth was stained with blood. I do think you have some explaining to do. I can, I can. Just give me a chance. Okay, so perhaps if you take me back to the beginning of the story, you were on your way to Jericho, and that was on important business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I frequently travel um, for the company like that. It's a tiring journey. It's a rough road. 
um, and it can be dangerous. Okay, so you fancy stopping off at an inn, you fancy something to eat, something to drink, reckless of the effect that this delay is going to have on your employer's profits, on con consumer confidence, you ignored your need to meet your targets. No, no, I'm a careful, conscientious man. But some things are more important than profits. Even more important, dare I say, than, than loyalty to my employers. Really? Do go on. Well, it was like this. I was about halfway between Jerusalem and Jericho in a steep, rocky ravine. It was dark and desolate. I saw bones, animal bones, probably the bones of a sheep or perhaps a goat. I'm not sure which, but I tell you, it was scary. It made me think. It, it made me a bit fearful, actually. Even though I've been through that path many times before, it always felt, you know, like some menace. You know, there were vultures circling around above and things like that. Then a hundred yards beyond the animal carcass, there was a man. He was lying by the road. I'm, I'm sure he was dying. So you went to help him. Yeah. Was that the sensible thing to do in all of this uh, menace? Well, Sensible, I don't know about sensible, but it was the right thing to do. Was it? Uh, as far as I'm aware, you're not a qualified first aider. Uh, you're not part of the mountain rescue team. Um, you're just a businessman going about company business. So where were your priorities? Where they ought to be with seeing a wounded, probably without some help, a dying man in front of me. He was very near the end in a terrible, desolate location. The vultures were gathering, other stripped bones nearby. They tell their own story. The man, whoever he was, whatever his story, he needed help, my help at once. Nothing else matters. But I'm sure, I'm sure there must have been other people on that road. It was a direct route to the city that must have been busy. Why didn't you just call for help? You really think that would have worked? I don't think so. People can surprise you, even shock you. You know, I've been watching as I crested the rise there, and I could see quite a long way ahead of me. And yes, there were other people about. I saw one of them, quite this chap. Yeah, I watched this chap approach. He looked like a vicar or something, big, long, black gown, head in the clouds, mumbling away, you know the sort of thing. Um, I saw him peer at the dead animal. Then he went on a bit further and he peered at what I thought that time was some kind of old rubbish dump there. He seemed to sniff as if you know, deploring people who chuck rubbish away in the pristine wilderness. Then he went on his way. Um, I understand there was another man? Yeah, there was, yeah. yeah. Soon, after I was getting a bit nearer this time, this chap came into view. He'd been hidden behind some rocks, um, so I couldn't see him originally. Um, he looked like a teacher of some sort, you know? He was reading a book and scribbling along in the margin with a pencil as he walked, like he was preparing for a lecture or something. I don't think he even saw the sheep. He was too busy making his notes. <laughs> but he saw the man, all right, because he stopped dead right there in his tracks, and then sidled past him, pressing himself right up against the rock face to avoid having even to, having to get even any closer to him. Mm. Then he couldn't get away fast enough. And, and what about you then? Well, by then I was a bit closer and I could see what both of them have seen. It was definitely a man who was desperately in need. And I knew if he was going to get help, well, I'd have to provide it. Um, so, yes, I did what I could, and I used what I had to hand. I had the wine to clean his wounds and the oil to soothe them. So, yeah, I did use my employers in property, but, yeah, I took the time it was needed, my employer's time, if you insist on looking at it that way. And the donkey? Well, let's get it all out in the open, then. I put the man on my donkey, the company donkey. Then I walked because, well, he couldn't. Um, not in the state he was in. I reckon it was mine to lend at the moment. So, let me get this straight. You don't think that if two eminently respected men of the community had already avoided him, perhaps you should sensibly do the same? After all, um, I have statements here. They were both upstanding members of the local community. 
the witness statements show that they were indeed a priest and a lecturer from the university. I've got their testimony here, and um, it rather makes you look quite bad. I don't see how that is. Well, let's start with the vicar. He was on his way to an important meeting, he says. And he says here that loitering in the wilderness would have been a waste, a dangerous waste of time. And he says, anyhow, the man was dead, you shouldn't interfere with the dead. But he wasn't dead, that's a plain lie. Well, then perhaps the man was a fraud, just plain dead. I've, I've heard a few scams like that in my time. And, and of course, um, I have to remind you that no badly injured man has come back or no reports have been received despite our attempts to find him. Well, give me a break, I'm not surprised he's gone. He was traumatised, poor man. He was battered, he was bruised, he was terrified out of his mind. I left him in the care of the staff of the inn and I bet he disappeared as soon as he was able to get out of bed. I'd done the same thing in, this, in his place. It really isn't an area you want to stay in for too long. Well, OK, perhaps. And that reminds me, I've not had a statement from the innkeeper mm, yet. I'll just that. make a note to follow yeah. that up. He Please may do. have evidence to support mm, you. He should do. As I was saying, the other eyewitness, the teacher, says he was on his way to class. He says he hesitated, but the wounded man was probably a decoy, maybe one of a gang of thieves, and he suggests that you were in league with them. Even if you weren't, you were encouraging loungers and scroungers by throwing charity around. And as he tells it, even if you weren't, well, colluding in feckless, even criminal behaviour, you were definitely neglecting your employer's work and your duties as a citizen. Oh, but then, as he points out in his statement, you're, you're not a citizen, you're a foreigner. And he says, as I quote, they're all alike, these immigrants, they look after their own. Well, actually, guilty as charged, but he wasn't just one of my own, because he was one of us all. He was a fellow human being. Can't you see, I had to look after him. I couldn't just leave him. I couldn't leave someone, anyone. I couldn't leave them just to die. It isn't right. <sighs> Maybe you're right. Maybe, I, maybe the rabbi outside was right about understanding God's way. Maybe compassion does have to be the first priority. Okay, maybe we shall see if we can sort it out with your employers. Come on. Thank you. We will sing again from Singing the Faith, number 249. Jesu, Jesu, fill us with your love.
Let us pray. For the blessings of this and all our days, we thank you, gracious God. Accept, we pray, not just this money, but also our lives, freely offered in gratitude for all you have done for us. Use them both, in this place and wherever you might take us. Amen. We come to our prayers of intercession and you will see that there is a response. Lord, in your love and mercy, please respond. Hear our prayer. God, our fellow traveller, we pray for those setting out on a journey, holiday makers, families moving home, refugees on their way from various countries not knowing where they are going sometimes. And for those setting out on a new journey of life, babies and children, young people leaving home, some preparing to go to college and university this year, new Christians, encircle them with love, protect and guide them. Lord, in your love and mercy, hear our prayer. God, our fellow traveller, we pray for those injured on a journey, the victims of crime, the victims of accidents, the victims of disease, and for those wounded on the journey of life, children neglected or abused, those ill in body, mind or spirit, the anxious, the despairing, the bereaved, and we think today particularly of the family of Les Charlton. Bind up their wounds, comfort and strengthen them. Lord, in your love and mercy, hear our prayer. God, our fellow traveler, we pray for those who help us on our journeys. Workers in the tourist industry, often working unsocial hours. Strangers who befriend us and lend a hand aid workers among the homeless and destitute, and for those who help us along the journey of life, family, friends, teachers, preachers, counselors, the household of faith. Keep us traveling together. Unite us in your love. Lord, in your love and mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. And finally, a thought to take home with us. If we were asked to give examples of neighborliness, we would probably all be able to do so without much trouble. Perhaps our minds will go back to the pandemic, when there were so many stories of people shopping for strangers who, who, who were self-isolating, or posties taking the time to ask, everything okay? As they handed over the latest online order. Or perhaps we have stories of how generous the community have been to the local food bank, or appeal to the homeless shelter, or whatever it is. But do we ever ask ourselves about our motives for doing or not doing something? In Jesus' parable, the priest and the Levite were both good men. They knew the law, and they knew that godly men kept it. That's how you build and reinforce a godly community, even though it sometimes meant drawing a hard line around the community. So they did not help the man who had been attacked, who needed help, the man who was different, who looked different, was of a different religion, a different culture. We don't do that today. If you're not saying that, you might be thinking it. 
Off the top of your head, you probably can't think of any reason why a good, socially conscious Christian would not feel obliged to help an injured and dying man. We can't imagine ourselves as being rule-bound, as apparently uncaring to the injured man as those two good Jewish men were. We can't imagine ourselves being put off because a person in desperate need is from another culture or another religion or looks different or speaks with a different accent or language. Or would we? The question that the lawyer asked Jesus was, who is my neighbor? Jesus' answer was to ask, who showed neighborliness? Go and do likewise. Our challenge is not to know who our neighbors are so that we can help them. It is to ask ourselves if we are being good neighbors, showing God's mercy to anyone and everyone who needs it. So now we sing again. From Singing the Faith, number 415, The Church of Christ in Every Age. Beset by change, but spirit-led. Lord, help us to look for the good in our neighbours. Help us to recognise that neighbourliness goes two ways. Make us gracious as well as generous, receptive to the ideas and perspectives as well as the needs of others, remembering that as we meet them, we meet you. Amen. <laughs>